car driver Mario Andretti once said, if everything seems under control, you're not going fast enough. Are we going fast enough for today's high-speed connectivity demands? Could we go faster? Oh, yes. Yes, we can. How about 224 gigabits per second fast? Oh, yeah. Hey, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. Data rates are getting faster with each passing year. In this episode of Chalk Talk, Matthew Burns from Samtech joins me to separate fact from fiction when it comes to 224 gigabits per second data rates. We take a closer look at the design challenges, trade-offs, and architectural decisions that we will need to consider when designing a 224 gigabits per second design. We also investigate the variety of interconnect solutions that Samtech offers for your next 224 gigabits per second design. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about this topic from Samtech. Hi, Matt. Thank you so much for joining me. Hey, Amelia. It's good to be with you yet again. Excellent. Okay, so Matt, we're talking about 224 gigabits per second data rates today. But Matt, before we jump into the details, what kind of designs are demanding these kinds of data rates today? One of the interesting trends that we've seen in the last couple of years, Amelia, at least from Samtech's perspective, is that we've gone from being a follower to a leader in terms of data rate capabilities. What do I mean by that? If you look at the graph on this slide, this is an approximation of the data rate capabilities of semiconductor solutions in the dotted blue line versus the data rate capabilities of interconnect, at least from, from Samtech's perspective. And within the last several years, we've seen a crossover where the interconnect companies such as Samtech are starting to lead in terms of product availability when it comes to data rate. So interconnect versus semiconductors. Why is that? Well, we're seeing a tremendous amount of catalysts that are driving growth in the electronics industry. From a design standpoint, the focus always was starting with the IC or the ASIC within the design, and then Interconnect was sort of an afterthought. However, as we've gotten into bleeding edge speeds, 28 gigabit, 56 gigabit, 112, and then you know what's coming in 224, OEM design engineers really have to think about the entire signal chain. Not only do they have to worry about how their ASIC is going to perform, but how is their ASIC going to perform with Interconnect? And what we've really seen driving that demand within the industry is looking at several catalysts, including the global rollout of 5G, what seems like the exponential growth of AI and high-performance computing, and then the innovation of Automotive 2.0, not only around electrification, but around autonomous vehicles. So... All of this innovation, all of these catalysts are doing for data rates what the PC revolution did in the 80s and what the internet revolution of the late 90s did. So we're really excited because we have so many different catalysts that are driving demand for more data. And we're also getting a tremendous amount of interest from the semiconductor industry saying, we see where the industry's going. How do we get our electrons from silicon to silicon? Or even in the optical domain, how do I get photons from point A to point B? So that's really where Samtech's silicon to silicon solutions are answering the technical renaissance that's happening, not only at 112 right now, but 224, which is on the roadmap. Okay, so Matt, we're talking about high level trends here and catalysts of one sort or another, but are you seeing anything that really shows us that 224 gigabits per second is actually real? I mean, we're not just talking about fiction here, are we? No, not at all. That's why we've subtitled it fact or fiction. When you look at the demand for 224 gigabit per second performance, we're starting to see real solution, real innovation, real responses to the demands of the market. A good example of that is really in the semiconductor space. Intel was the first semiconductor company publicly that demonstrated 224 gigabit per second silicon. They actually did that way back in August of 2020. And now we're starting to see roadmap solutions that include that demonstration, CERTES technology that they've been working on for a number of years. In addition to 
uh, Intel, another company that we see that has 224 gigabit per second IP is uh, Surdy's provider, AlphaWave. And there's other uh, companies we know that are working on 224 gigabit per second silicon or IP and the Surdy's retimer physical layer space that we expect to come to market over the next several years. In addition, complementing the efforts going on within the semiconductor space. In the interconnect space, we're also working on interconnect solutions, which we'll detail in this chalk talk, that reach into 224. That's not just getting electrons from point A to point B, but that's test and measurement, that's backplane, that's high-speed board-to-board, and a number of applications that are crucial to support 224 system-level performance when the market and timing is right. Another mile marker, you may say, that we see is test and measurement devices. You know, when you look at the leading high performance test and measurement providers, their testing solutions, VNAs, ZNAs, oscilloscopes, function generators, signal generators, they're all supporting 224 gigabit per second performance now as we speak because of the research and the development that's being done. What's really, I think, a big mile marker is the work that we're seeing within the standards and protocol spaces. So looking at IEEE with Ethernet and OIF for optical solutions, the work that's being done within the MSA is for front panel optics and front panel uh, pluggable transceivers. You really see a groundswell of support for the reality of 224 gigabit per second performance. So we're really excited about everything that's happening, and we anticipate to see a growth in the number of mile markers, not only in 2022, but in the years to come. So Matt, where exactly are we going as an industry when it comes to 224 gigabits per second? Amelia, have you ever asked someone for directions and they point left and right at the same time and say, go that way? Sure. (laughs) That's kind of where we're at to a degree when it comes to 224. Now, The illustration here on this slide may be a bit tongue-in-cheek, but it does illustrate a lot of the work that's being done to determine the best path for 224 performance optically, copper, and then also the support from test and measurement and then the RF domain. One of the biggest challenges that the industry is faced right now is what modulation scheme the protocols are going to use to transmit that data so fast. There's only so much bandwidth that you have in a copper wire. There's only so much bandwidth you have in a PCB trace. There's only so much bandwidth you have in an interconnect or a package on an IC. So the industry needs to figure out how to get as much bits into as little frequency as possible. And that's where the modulation schemes come in. I've listed this as PAMX because from a pulse amplitude modulation standpoint, is it going to be four 6, 8, 16, the industry is really looking at what makes the most sense for specific applications along the signal chain. There's also additional modulation schemes that may be under consideration in specific applications such as QPSK and QAM16. Related to that, depending upon what modulation scheme is chosen for a specific application, there's also the challenge of transmitting these signals at various Nyquist frequency options. There's a lot of debate in the industry as to what makes the most sense. Broadcom of Ogco's demonstrated solutions, 38 to 44 gigahertz. Intel is promoting 224 PAM4, which is what they've demonstrated their transceiver technology at. So it's going to be interesting to see how that all falls out. From a system level standpoint, there's a number of challenges. There's mechanical issues. There's limits to the density that are achievable, whether that's on the IC, the interconnect, the PCB level, a cable assembly. Packaging, obviously, is a big source of loss, especially on the IC side. There's thermal, right? Increased density, increased speed. You're going to have heat. How do you manage all that, whether that's at the IC, the line card, or at the chassis level? One of the challenges that we're seeing when developing 224 gigabit per second solutions is how do you manufacture it? I can simulate something, this looks really good in the virtual world or the digital twin, but can I manufacture it in a high volume setting? And not only can I keep tight tolerances on plastics and metals and PCBs and trace routes, but as the system gets denser, what about the stack ups of all those tolerances? And then the last question really is the timeline. When is demand for 224 going to reach the hockey stick effect? Is that going to be 2024? Is that going to be 2030? 
there's a lot of debate there as well. The one thing that we do know is demand for data is not going to drop off, and the trend for more data in a smaller space is not going to drop off either. So we're going to get there one way or the other. So Matt, with these kind of fast data rates, I would imagine there are some trade-offs to consider. Yeah, there is. And this is just one data point to consider. What are the trade-offs depending upon the modulation scheme that may be chosen? This graph, I've taken this data from multiple sources, and the data is relatively the same depending upon where you get at it. We've validated these numbers internally. We've also seen them validated externally. But if you look at 224, PM4, all the way up to 224, PM16, you'll see that there's pros and cons of various modulation schemes. The more bits per symbol you get, the more efficient the system is in terms of bits at a particular Nyquist frequency. You know, it's much easier to design around a 28 gigahertz signal versus a 56. However, the inverse challenge is at 56 gigahertz Nyquist, I've got a signal to noise ratio of 20.4 dBs that I can work with. Because SERDIs have to be more sensitive, the SNR is increased. So that presents a lot more signal integrity challenges on the IC side. So there's trade-offs between efficiency of modulation versus the sensitivity of the SERDIs, which become very expensive and a challenge to design. The other thing to consider is whatever modulation schemes are chosen, it really should work in copper and in optics. At 56 gigabit per second, we've been very fortunate as an industry because 56 GPM4 works both well in the copper and the optic domain. And as we've illustrated with the trade-offs between SNR and Nyquist, there's design challenges. Where's the fine balance between not being overly complex, but not making the system so sensitive that they become cost prohibitive to design? So, you know, those are kind of high level design concerns. Obviously, we can't get into a ton of detail in such a short presentation, but this illustrates the challenges the industry faces moving to higher speed designs. That makes sense. Now, Matt, I would also imagine that there are architectural considerations to keep in mind here as well, right? Yeah, and that really plays into what an OEM is trying to accomplish. Am I trying to run 224 gigabit per second, die to die on the same substrate? Or am I going from a chip to a module within a transceiver? Am I going chip to chip on a line card? Am I going chassis to chassis? right? Depending upon the application that you're working on, that may influence the modulation scheme you want to work with. That may influence the domain that the data is sent through. Is it electrical? Is it electrical interconnect? If I go cable, is it cable versus optics? Do I use all three? So each particular architectural detail that we've provided here has pros and cons, and there's definitely benefits and disadvantages in terms of what domain and what modulation scheme makes the most sense within a particular application. Notwithstanding the SI, the packaging, the thermal, and other technical barriers that need to be overcome. So Matt, what should we be keeping in mind when it comes to signal integrity here? Therein lies one of the toughest challenges when it comes to designing ICs, die, interconnect, the entire signal channel at such high performance. This graph illustrates from Samtech's perspective, all of the key components that we look at when transmitting data from a IC transmitter to an IC receiver. We have to worry about the SI performance within the die or the IC. We have to worry about how the package of the IC affects that. We have to look at the transition from the IC to the PCB, the trace itself, the connector breakout region or BOR as we call it details how to get the signals from the PCB into the interconnect. The connector we show here is a mated pair. We assume two connectors there. And the same is true on the reverse from the connector through the PCB back to the receiver package and then to the receiver. We're illustrating a coplanar board-to-board interconnect with a transmitter and receiver on either PCB going from motherboard to component board. But that same thought process of being focused on channel level signal integrity applies in any channel that we may work with. So it's really a holistic approach to high performance from silicon to silicon or from transmitter to receiver that's necessary to achieve the high performance of 224 gigabits per second. 
So Matt, if I'm looking at 224 gigabits per second for my next design, what does Samtech offer in terms of connectors? That's a great question, Amelia. And we have a number of interconnect solutions that we have that are 224 gigabit per second capable. And the reason that we're mentioning them as being capable is that because there's a number of unknowns that we've already talked about, don't know the modulation schemes, don't know the protocols. There's a lot of unknowns. However, based on our initial testing and looking at some of the performance data of these interconnects we're going to talk about, we are highly confident that once a lot of these details are finalized, that some of the -the off-the-shelf solutions we offer right now will support 224 gigabit per second solutions. The first that we want to talk about is our flagship performing mezzanine connector, our Novaray Extreme Performance Arrays. They support up to four terabits per second aggregate data rate. Right now, we've tested them with up to nine IEEE 400 gigabit per second channels. So that's a really compact, really high performance solution. The contact design offers two points of contact, which not only gives you performance, but also reliability. The contacts have also been designed to offer fully shielded differential pairs. We have extremely low crosstalk to beyond 40 gigahertz, which is essential, especially depending upon the modulation scheme that's chosen. There's minimal variance in data rate as stack height increases. So again, that allows for a system level flexibility in terms of how it's designed. And because of the density of Novaray, it utilizes 40% less space with the same data throughput compared to traditional arrays. Okay, so Matt, how are these Novaray cables assembled? What kind of configuration are we looking at here? We've designed Novaray to be flexible enough not only to support board-to-board applications, but also cable-to-board applications. So Novaray cable assemblies use the same connector family, the same benefits of Novaray as the board mount solution. And we've cabled that using the high-performance ultra-low skew twin-axe cables that directly attach to the contacts on the Novaray connector on the cable assembly itself. You can see that the cable assemblies offer industry-leading aggregate data rates and roughly 60% the space. So it's high performance, it's small. The same contact design used in the Novare board to board or mezzanine connectors are used within the cable assemblies as well. So very low crosstalk, very tight impedance control. The graph on the lower left-hand side of the slide illustrates the flexibility we offer in terms of banks, rows, and total number of pairs within a Novare cable and board mount connector, which gives us up to four terabits per second performance. So we're highly confident. We've tested Novaray to 56G NRZ. We've tested Novaray to 112G PM4. And we're highly confident once the 224 modulation schemes get fully baked out that Novaray will support 224 as well. Excellent. Now, Matt, what about the front panel cable assemblies for the Novaray? Can you give me some details on that as well? Sure. Our Novaray I.O. front panel cable assemblies leverage the same contact design that our mezzanine connectors, our wire-to-board cables use. So Novaray I.O. is designed as a cable-to-cable front panel assembly that currently supports 112 GPM4 per channel with a roadmap to 224. Some of the additional features of Novaray I.O., are the pair counts. We offer eight, 16, and 32 pair options. These are readily available to support PCIe 6.0 and other popular protocols. You can see that the solution also offers rugged external shielding for EMI protection. In short, Novaray IO is the highest performance, highest density front panel cable assembly available on the market today. Okay, so what if I need a lower profile? What kind of options do you guys have for me here? Well, the next question that gets asked is, okay, I can get data board to board, I can get data cable to board, I can get data out the front panel. What solutions do you have that place the signal as close as possible to the ASIC without actually being on the ASIC package? That's where Samtech SciFly low profile high density cable system comes. The termination of the ultra-low skew twin axe to the interconnect to the PCB is enabled by an ultra-low profile interconnect that can be as close as possible to the ASIC as anything else on the market. SciFly can support up to 16 differential pairs in an incredibly small 3.8 millimeter profile. 
the reason that we have such a low profile on SciFly is when you look at 25.6 terabyte or 51.2 terabyte switching chassis, the need to get the interconnect as close to the ASIC while also providing a path for thermal relief is a necessity. So we've designed SciFly in addition to the rugged latching so that it can attach to the PCB or the substrate right next to the ASIC, but also allow a heat sink, whether that's a cold plate or a pin fin design, to mount over the SciFly packaging, providing additional thermal relief for the cables in addition to the ASIC. So we're real excited about SciFly. We're showing N1 right next to the ASIC. N2 obviously could go to Novaray. It could go to Novaray Cable. It could go to Novaray I.O. It's another tool in our toolbox to enable 224 gigabit per second performance as the industry gets there. Okay, so Matt, test is crucial to these kinds of high-speed designs, right? What do you guys offer in this arena? In previous Chalk Talks, Amelia, we've talked about our bullseye high-performance test system. The latest version of this solution enables testing out to 70 gigahertz. That's essential for 224 when you're talking about Nyquist frequencies at 56 gigahertz or even higher. Bullseye offers a compression interface mounted directly to the PCB so that allows for easy mating and unmating while eliminating solder costs. It's also high density and saves PCB space. If you look at the illustration on the upper center of this PCB, you see that we have roughly a four to one space savings on the PCB moving from discrete SMA vertical edge mount connectors to the bullseye bulkhead. So this makes evaluation boards, characterization cards for 224 silicon smaller and easier to manufacture. Bullseye also offers a ton of flexibility in terms of the RF cables it supports or the precision RF connectors on N2, including 292, 2.4, 1.85 millimeter, and roadmap to smaller diameter solutions, which offer higher frequency performance. In fact, we're this close, you know, thumb and index finger, millimeters apart, to having 90 gigahertz versions of Bullseye available. We expect to be able to release more information on that uh, later in 22. Excellent. Well, Matt, this was a lot to take in today. Can you recap your main points for me? I think the biggest thing that we've talked about is that 224 is fact. It's not fiction. There are a bunch of design concerns, though. The industry has to standardize on some sort of modulation scheme. It's probably going to be some sort of PAMX, PAM4, PAM6, PAM8. Once that's done, OEMs are going to be able to pick the right system architecture for their specific application. We've talked about how 224 high-performance solutions are really making the entire signal chain work. So it's finding the right partners from the semiconductor standpoint, interconnect standpoint, EDA, test and measurement, to bring the entire ecosystem together for a specific application. And then as an industry, there's also need to determine how we're going to combat crosstalk issues at such high speeds. We offer a growing portfolio of high-performance interconnect capable of 224. And we also back that up with our technical experts, online design tools, and world-class customer service that are available to support any application. For more information, your listeners can visit our website at www.samtech.com or email our technical experts at sig at samtech.com. Excellent. Well, as always, it was a pleasure speaking with you today, Matt. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amelia, and we look forward to chatting with you again. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about this topic from SamTech. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. You can't miss it. It's right across the top. Or check out YouTube, youtube.com slash eejournal.